uh, taking into account the full uh, spectrum of possibilities. In the one hand, we see how um, biomedical studi studies may be biased by not considering the sex and gender issues properly. And this has been a, a big problem in the past and is still a problem. And we consider these positive biases, biases that have to be introduced in the studies to make them fair in a way that they treat, they treat sex in the proper way. The physiological differences between men and women. In the other hand, we see these other undesirable biases as the ones that are introduced by computational methods, in particular artificial intelligence, where they are not designed or trained properly, and they end up producing results that are not adequate to the treatment of women and men. And we have seen uh, very bad examples of systems that uh, when you ask who is cooking, they will always say a woman is cooking uh, because they are trained with the data in which essentially women are the ones that are cooking. So that's a anecdotal, but has a lot of consequences if these uh, biases are perpetuated. So as uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, we started a program, Bioinfo for Women, three years ago, dedicated to the study of uh, sex and gender biases in biomedicine and artificial intelligence. We have uh, already a we'll say, reasonable activity, scientific activity in this area. And we thought that as an extension of, of these activities, we could organize this workshop today with some uh, four very distinguished uh, speakers that will uh, illustrate us and tell us about these issues of uh, biases uh, across all these domains, from the more biomedical to the more uh, artificial intelligence, but also including the ethical and legal issues around these, uh, uh, these problems. So without uh, more uh, further introduction, uh, let's see if the magic of internet is working and we get the um, speakers online. So the first speaker uh, talking about biases in biomedical data sets and implications is Dr. Maria Teresa Ferretti. She is the chief scientific officer of the Women Brain Project, uh, a, um, an organization in Switzerland that has done, uh, I would say, amazing work in discussing uh, these issues and publishing these issues uh, in different areas. So if um, we have um, Maria Teresa online, and the presentation. Chan, chan, chan. That's the <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> and uh, also, can you see my slides? Not yet. I am waiting for some signs from the technical team. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, I see. Uh, okay, they say just one moment. <laughs> so <good>. it's coming. <laughs> 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 They're working on it. So maybe I can just start uh, with a few words while we work on the, on the technology. Um, so it's, uh, it's really a great honor for me to be here. Thanks to Alfonso for the kind invitation. Uh, and it's also quite a big responsibility to open this workshop. Uh, I'm doing this on behalf of an organization which is called the Women's Brain Project, which is a non-profit organization founded in Switzerland, which I'm representing today. Uh, I'm the co-founder and chief scientific officer. Uh, so what I'm going to show you today is really a perspective from this team of scientists and various stakeholders uh, working in this field. And uh, my idea for the next slides, if you manage to see them, otherwise I just tell you, <laughs> is um, to give you really an introduction on uh, a little bit about our work in this field, uh, a couple of definitions of what we mean by sex and gender, gender medicine, precision medicine. And finally, uh, we will focus on um, sex and gender biases in biomedical data sets with some implications and some uh, comments, which I hope will be useful for the subsequent um, discussion with the other speakers. Um, at this point, I would need to know if we can start or uh, there is still a delay. <laughs> mm. Not yet. We Not yet. Have the slide yet. Uh, so I can 
basically start with a few, a couple of things on the Women's Brain Project, and then hopefully we will have uh, the slides um, as a backup. Uh, my, my first couple of slides were really uh, introducing you to this group in case you're not familiar with it. I thought it would be nice to have a very short introduction. Um, this is, uh, as I said, it's a group of scientists. We are uh, quite a special organization. It's composed mostly by scientists coming from different disciplines. I'm a neuroscientist and neuroimmunologist, but we have experts in medicine, in psychology, uh, experts in completely different fields, a lot of engineers and bioengineers. Uh, but we also work with patients and uh, um, caregivers, uh, and we work very closely with other stakeholders like um, academia, company, and uh, regulators. Now and we see you. I think now I see my slides. <laughs> so slide. let me continue. Um, as I told you, this is the, the outline of what I would like to tell you today about, a bit about our group, uh, and then some definitions and some examples on the topic we are discussing today. Uh, this is about the Women's Brain Project. As I was telling you, we are a group of mostly scientists and our mission is to try and improve the current state of medical treatment, which is largely based on one size fits all. And we actually think that we should move forward uh, towards um, a precision medicine approach. And I will tell you more about this uh, later. Uh, and we think that sex and gender differences are the gateway towards precision medicine. So we're very passionate about this topic uh, because it's a very important by itself, but we also see the value and the importance of discussing this type of biases to make the point about existing biases and existing dif inter-individual differences among patients. And, and so it's uh, by discussing sex and gender differences and biases, we are actually um, exposing a more general problem in, in medicine and hopefully finding more general uh, solutions towards precision medicine. Uh, in briefly, this is what we do. We are scientists, so we mostly publish, publish research, basic research, and uh, a lot of uh, reviews as well, and opinion pieces, uh, policy reports as well. Um, we organize events. Um, you are uh, all uh, warmly invited to join the Emotions Forum, which uh, we are co-shaping with the Brain uh, Circle uh, this year and next year, is an itinerant forum. And finally, we organize a lot of teaching and outreach activities. Uh, and uh, I just want to highlight in our publishing, you also see a couple of books. We just published the first textbook on sex and gender differences in Alzheimer's disease. And I will give you a couple of examples on that because that's really my expertise. Uh, but coming soon, we're gonna have uh, the next uh, book in the series that we're publishing with Elsevier. Uh, it's called Sex and Gender Bias in Technology and Artificial Intelligence. So this is really uh, highly relevant for the discussion of today. Um, it's going to be the very first textbook and reference on this specific topic uh, coming out in, uh, in March uh, 2022. So I recommend you to check it out because you, you're going to have the state of the art there. Uh, and uh, I just want to praise the editors who are Davide Cirillo, Silvina uh, um, Solars, and Emre uh, Gune, who are also based in uh, Barcelona, and many of them working at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So it's, uh, uh, there is a very strong imprint from, uh, from Barcelona in this work. And this actually came out as a natural continuation of a work that we had started as a paper, as a review paper published in Nature, uh, Nature uh, Digital Medicine. Uh, and this was the first review that actually put together um, the, the current evidence on the importance of sex and gender differences and potential biases in artificial intelligence applied to biomedicine and healthcare. Uh, we felt that at that point, we were starting to have a good conversation about sex and gender differences in medicine, but there was really not much discussion about how all these differences at the clinical level would actually translate in terms of technologies, digital biomarkers, and potentially artificial intelligence applications as well. So we started with this paper and actually went so well and the material was so large that uh, we actually decided to have an entire uh, book on it. So again, congratulations to the, to the authors. Uh, so what is the main issue that we are discussing here? And I would like to give you a couple of definitions so that we can continue the conversation. Uh, first of all, I think, um, I, I hope you will agree with me that the future uh, and uh, possibly even the present is about uh, precision medicine. So historically, we have done medicine based on intuition and analyzing signs and symptoms. Medicine was more like an art than a science. Uh, the present is mostly based on evidence-based medicine, clinical trial-based uh, data. 
Um, so clinical trials are the main tool that we use to define evidence, but really the future, what we are witnessing right now developing, um, it's precision medicine. So a medicine that uses um, biomarkers and uh, can identify the right treatment for the right per, uh, person at the right time. And this is going to be largely based on algorithms. So uh, artificial in intelligence application to uh, medicine. And um, why are we talking about sex and gender differences here and how could they impact uh, actually precision medicine? What I hope I will convince you by the end of this uh, very short presentation is that uh, when we are talking about giving the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, whether this person is a man or a woman makes a difference. And before we go ahead, I just want to give definitions um, in the context of this presentation, what we mean by sex and what we mean by gender. Uh, by sex, we define these uh, differences between men and women that uh, arise from the expression of sexual chromosomes, so genetic differences and hormonal differences. In the vast majority of cases, sex is binary, but there are exceptions, and actually we should start studying them uh, a bit more carefully, but the evidence is, is very limited. Uh, and in contrast to this quite relatively clear distinction, gender is a more fluid concept. Um, it's uh, relatively harder to, to define. When we talk about gender medicine, gender refers to the role in the society of what it means in a society to be a man or a woman. So the roles, the expectations, the stereotypes as well that are associated. And the typical example is uh, education, access to education, especially in the, in the previous generations. But right now, still in developing countries, access to education is different for girls and boys. Uh, with uh, men having uh, more access. And, and so education is actually one of the social determinants of health. Um, and low education is a risk factor for a number of pathologies, including dementia. So something that is not biological is, is derived from, is a sociocultural construct, right? Uh, but it is related to be a man or a woman in a society can affect our health. And so the, it is the WHO that says that both sex and gender are determinants of health because the type of disease you will get, the type of the response to the treatment that you will uh, display, and also your access, your capability to access healthcare will be different for men uh, and women, for both biological and societal considerations. And so there is an entire branch of medicine that is called gender medicine, and I really want to highlight that this is not just about reproductive health, because men and women are different in many ways. That is not just about the bikini area, so it's not bikini medicine. But uh, important and really robust differences have been described in the functioning of a number of systems from the musculoskeletal, metabolism, the heart, the, the metabolism of drugs, we will talk about this, the brain and the immune system. So there is really a lot of research and a lot of data uh, at research level. And now um, the Women's Brain Project in particular is fighting to, um, to define better these differences, study them, but also position them so that there is an actual change in clinical uh, practice. And we believe there should be a change also with artificial intelligence. Just an example of how relevant these differences can be in the context of precision medicine. Uh, it's a very famous example of a drug called uh, Zolpidem which is a drug approved for uh, uh, insomnia, for treating insomnia. The Americans call it a Z drug, Z drug. And this is largely used, it's, uh, it's very commonly prescribed. And after a while that this drug was in the market, the FDA, which is the regulatory body of uh, the United States, of course, uh, started to receive complaints, uh, so at the pharmacovigilance stage, uh, of uh, issues the next day after uh, taking the drug. So issues with drowsiness, even accidents, like car accidents happening because people were not completely lucid after taking the drug the night before. And uh, there was an, in an internal investigation and the FDA um, came to realize that actually the drug was metabolized in different ways between men and women. And actually most complainers were women in this case. So the problems were mostly uh, rising in the uh, female population. And when they went back and they checked their own data, they actually realized that in the pharmacokinetic studies, it was quite obvious that men were metabolizing more slowly uh, the drug as compared to men. So basically the next day, women still had the drug in their system and that's why they were so uh, drowsy. And as a consequence, and in a very historical move, the FDA actually changed the label of the drug, recommended those adjusted, um, uh, sex adjusted dosing for, uh, for this drug. 
so how did we come here actually? And, and I think it's really not just the, the, the fact on itself, but the process that led to this that is interesting for us. And the process is that for a very long time, uh, women have been excluded uh, from um, clinical studies, especially safety. So the first phases of uh, clinical examination of new drugs where we test safety. Um, and that was done to protect women of childbearing age, uh, to avoid issues if a pregnancy would come, and so to protect the women and the offspring. Uh, so it was intended in a very positive way. For many years, drugs were tested um, with a very minimal contribution of uh, uh, women data. The problem is that we realize now, like in the example of Zolpidem, that actually this created a gap, a knowledge gap. So we do not know what is the actual toxicity of a lot of drugs, specifically in women. And these are data that we start to collect only in pharmacovigilance stage. So it is the whole process of developing a drug that should take into consideration the sex and gender differences that actually exist. So how does this actually apply in the context of the, the topic of today, which is technologies and uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, this is a, a very exciting and but also complicated uh, topic. And I've also already gave you some of my, my, uh, the main points that I would also like to discuss with you. Uh, the first starting point is about data, biomedical data. And um, I think we are all quite aware that data are biased by themselves, a lot of data sets. Uh, they are largely biased towards uh, male, especially in some indications, uh, and also Caucasian, unfortunately. So uh, these are some um, actual statistics from genetics uh, and, and genomic studies, uh, GWAS uh, studies, um, that actually, unfortunately, still today, I mean, this was 2016, but it has not improved so much, um, show that the vast majority of data that we have represent a mostly uh, Caucasian European uh, population from a genetic point of view. Uh, there has been improvement over the past years, but it's still uh, quite uh, biased, if you want. And, and this issue of data sets being biased, it's actually a very big one at various levels, including sex bias. But this is just, I mean, one example. And um, there are many different types of biases, and I would like to discuss a few with you. But my main message that I want to highlight is that actually right now we are at a historical point where we can uh, we are developing solutions that we will be using in five and 10 years. So now is the moment to actually think very carefully how we want to develop these solutions. Because we have the possibility of using algorithms and novel technologies uh, in, a, in a not very smart way, let's say. And if we are not careful enough, we can actually magnify this and perpetuate these sex and gender biases that we already have in our system. So we have we are facing a big risk right now, and this is also one of my main uh, take-home messages. But at the same time, technology could actually help us reducing the inequality. So if we use it properly, it might actually be the solution to the problem. And I'm an optimist, so I hope this will be uh, actually the future. So there are several levels where biases can occur when we are developing algorithms or uh, novel uh, solutions. And there are biases at the level of the data generation, and we have seen a couple of examples, uh, but also biases that can be developed during the building of the model and its implementation. The historical bias is actually what Alfonso was referring to, that if you have um, natural uh, language processing tools, for instance, that analyze text, and you feed them with text that consistently associates the cooking to females, and whatever is about cooking or house chores is always in relation to females, your algorithm will actually learn that cooking is a female thing. And so uh, there is, of course, no fault in the algorithm. It's just correctly analyzing, interpreting the material that is given to, uh, to it. So this is a type of historical bias that can be present in the data set, and we have to be careful not to perpetuate that. Uh, and I mean, this is something that we can actively uh, do, can be fixed, and we sh it should be fixed. Uh, we have representation bias. And uh, this is the example that I gave you, for instance, of uh, women being excluded um, from, the develop from the clinical evaluation at the safety level of drugs. So the safety data actually do not represent sufficiently the female population. Um, and, and so that what happens is that you end up with a data set that is not fully representative of the population of interest. And then you can also have measurement bias. And there are various examples, uh, something that we are very uh, aware of is, for instance, biases in diagnosis of diseases. So you can have diseases that are more diagnosed in women, for instance, depression, or in men, for instance, autism. 
But there is the possibility that our own diagnosis uh, is uh, gender biased and that we, because we are more familiar with uh, female symptoms of depression, we tend to diagnose it more in women while men have different symptoms and they miss a diagnosis. The other way around, we are more familiar with the autistic presentation in little boys, so that when a little girl has autism, actually you might be missing the diagnosis because the clinicians are not used to that specific presentation. So even measuring things can have a sex and gender bias and we should try and, and pick that up. And then of course, while developing the algorithms, um, the, the whole, um, at, the, at the building and implementation level, uh, we should also be careful and aware of the existence of biases. But going back to something that Alphonse already mentioned to you, and I personally thought that it was one of the most interesting messages of the paper that uh, we published in uh, uh, Nature Digital Medicine last year, uh, because I haven't seen this uh, stated so clearly in, uh, in other uh, fora. And I think it's a very important concept, the concept of undesirable biases, but also desirable biases. So we always talk about bias as something bad. There is a negative uh, annotation to this word, but actually, if you think about it, there are some biases that in, in the context of medicine, we need to keep and leverage. So undesirable biases are the ones we have been talking until now, right? Are biases that distinguish men and women in a way that discriminates, create inequalities, um, leads to actual under-treatment or bad mistreatment or misdiagnosis of uh, people. So this is definitely a bias that you don't want to have in your system. Uh, but at the same time, there are desirable biases. And by that, what we mean is that there are differences between men and women. And these differences will exist, will be represented in, a, in your data set. And instead of just deleting, and um, in a lot of studies, uh, sex is adjusted for, so just eliminate the whole dimension of, of sex, for instance, we should actually leverage it. We should be aware and conscious that these differences exist. And we should make this a strength of our tools. We should leverage this type of differences to actually make solutions more, um, more powerful in, in predicting, for instance, if it's uh, a risk assessment tool or in diagnosis, if it's a diagnostic um, tool. So we should always be very aware of these two uh, aspects. And a, an example from the Alzheimer's field, which is where uh, I've been working on for most of my uh, scientific career, um, Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disorder. Two thirds of patients are women. Uh, and in 2018, we published a review paper, which was published in Nature Reviews Neurology, to highlight the existence of a number of differences between men and women. And this was beyond the frequency of the disease. So never mind that there are more women with, than men with Alzheimer's. But it was really, if you have a man with Alzheimer's and a woman with Alzheimer's, do they look the same? Or is there anything different that we should be aware of? And um, this was based on the review of the literature. And actually, we found a lot of interesting um, elements in the, and evidence in the, in the literature pointing to differences in disease progression, in biomarkers, in diagnostics, um, even in response to treatment. So uh, quite important differences that actually might help us to, uh, to develop better solution for Alzheimer's, which is still, a, a very, still represents a very uh, huge unmet clinical need, unfortunately. And we actually ended up publishing a book about uh, this same topic because there, there has been an explosion of studies on exactly this topic. So right now we have a lot of evidence. And one of the things we realize is that the clinical symptoms can be different between men and women. Uh, women tend to mask uh, early symptoms. Uh, because they overperform in uh, verbal memory tests. So anything that is verbal memory related, women will do very well, even though they have uh, Alzheimer's pathology in their brains. And so clinical scales to uh, diagnose and to identify neuropsychological uh, problems um, should be sex adjusted. That's what we uh, recommend. And then we started discussing actually what would happen with a digital biomarker. Uh, now we have the rise of novel digital biomarkers that using either apps or um, yeah, various tools with your uh, phone or uh, your tablet can help identify either risk or uh, predict the development of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we have been working with a developer of one such an app, uh, which is called Altoida, uh, because we were very curious to know if this type of digital biomarkers would behave differently from um, standard clinical biomarkers, so the clinical neuropsychological scales. And uh, we have been analyzing the data that uh, were developed during the um, 
yeah, were developed by the uh, the app um, producers. Uh, and um, we have been analyzing this by uh, sex dividing men and women. And we've been finding a lot of differences even there. Uh, th there are so many differences that actually one can develop a sex classifier. So based on the, the, the date, the use of this app, uh, you can develop a classifier that can tell you whether you are a man or a woman using the app, which is, of course, not the point of the exercise, but it's just to point to how many differences we, we have in the, embedded in this data. And our dream is actually to make this, this type of digital biomarker even better in predicting the development of Alzheimer's disease by taking into consideration the sex and gender differences. So the conclusions and my take on messages um, are, um, and uh, I would really like to hear also the opinions of the other panelists uh, of today, are that actually these differences exist in medicine and there are really a lot of examples that we can bring. Um, if we don't consider them, of course, there is a problem in generating dangerous biases and even mistreatment or misdiagnosis. So it is a big problem in general in the context of precision medicine. And artificial intelligence has the potential to again, perpetuate these biases if we don't do it well, but I do think we have an opportunity right now uh, to actually do things better, mitigate or even fix the gender bias in healthcare. And um, my dream is actually to, uh, to make uh, AI tools even better, you know, with increased predictive or diagnostic power, considering the sex and gender differences, and in the future, considering individual characteristics, even beyond sex and gender. So that's my final slide. I would like to thank you on behalf of the team, inviting you to follow us on social media, to support us, and uh, thank you from the, the whole group. Thank you, Maria Teresa. <laughs> so I think we have the, the questions and uh, hopefully some time for discussion uh, at the end. Um, so we move to the, to the second speaker. Um, Fortunately, the second speaker was going to be Merced Crosas, that is now the secretary of, uh, of the Comera Verde of the Generalitat of the Department of Asian Exterior and Transparencia. But the bad thing about inviting people from the government is that they may fail in the last minute for some important reasons, so she cannot make it today. So we are going to miss Merced's uh, talk. So we move to the, to the third speaker, what was going to be the third speaker, uh, the second speaker. Artificial intelligence applications for disease prediction from a gender aware perspective. And we have we are very lucky to have with us Alison Gardner, Professor Alison Gardner from the University of Kiel. Uh, among other things, she's a co founder of Woman Leading in Artificial Intelligence. So, it's a very well known and reputed uh, expert in artificial intelligence. And uh, we really uh, are happy to have here her with us. Uh, in the distance, illustrating us about the implications of gender issues and uh, artificial intelligence. So hopefully the magic of internet will work again and we get uh, Alison on the screen with the presentation. Hello, everybody. Hello, good, to, Welcome. good to be here. Um, the magic of internet's working, but the magic of me didn't work so well. And I haven't set my slides in, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that will work and that will make our lives a little bit easier. So just bear with me one moment, which might mean that I disappear, but uh, hopefully we'll be okay. Can everybody see my screen yet? Not yet. Right. Uh, it says I'm screen sharing. So we'll see how we're doing. Something is moving. Yes, we see your presentation. No, not it's yet. It's just not slow. Yet. Not yet, not yet. Wait, wait. Yep. Here yes. we are. Yes. Is it? There it is. So, hello. So, this is me. Um, I, it, I'm just as well I didn't send my slides in because I was dutifully deleting a whole load because I was going to highlight, which I think is an outstanding piece of work. Um, the original um, article um, by David Cirillo um, that has just been presented to you by Mar Maria Teresa. And I have to say, it is really, really worth a reading. And God help them, there are so many references that they've listed. Um, and it's an easy read. And if, you have, you know, if you're busy people, do, do read that um, article. Um, sadly, I, I, I should have just left the, the um, 
the reference up for you and I, and I took it off. So I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just to introduce myself very briefly. Um, I do currently work at, um, at Keel University um, and I'm still a founder of Women Leading in AI, but I'm due to move in January to work at NICE in the UK. So that's the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. And that's the body that recommends um, the, you know, the guidelines by research-based guidelines on use of drug and treatment um, to the NHS in the UK, um, in particular within England. Um, and my role will be dealing with regulatory policy for the use of AI in medical um, technology. And I'm on a number of standards bodies that look at the use of this. So I'm very much interested in the regulatory approach because I have to say that I do get very, very annoyed that in 2021 we're still having to address these these issues and present these these um, examples of evidence that there are sex and gender based differences within um, health and, and medical research. And this is getting translated into AI solutions. But there's a wider infrastructure of bias that sits around those AI solutions, which I will touch on now that I have time because I don't have to go back on everything that uh, Maria has talked about. And again, if you're very busy people, two, two um, books that might be a very easy read for you would be Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez. Um, and the chapters on the drugs don't work and, and the Entel syndrome are the chapters that are relevant to healthcare in, in Invisible Women. And it really does look about the, the issue of data bias, um, that there is this lack of disaggregated data in terms of um, female patient data. And equally, this um, sex matters, which is great fun to be reading in public because everybody catches sight of the um, uh, heading and stops and slowly walks by to read it, and, uh, which is quite handy. And this is the stories about how, because of these you know, historical biases within healthcare and medical care, women are dying and these are being repeated over and over and over again and what shocked me is is that we still have to address the fact that this is often denied so um in caroline's book she she tells a, a, a um a, she outlines a paper that was developed it was published in um 20 let's have a remind myself when it was published 2018 it was and it was in the British Journal of Pharmacology, and it was written by an all-male panel, and they did a general review of the literature, looking at the problem, there's gender differences in clinical registration trials. Is there a real problem? And they unsurprisingly concluded, this is 2018, that there wasn't a real problem. Well, when you dig down into that data, and, and Caroline Prieto Perez does it very, very well, she sort of pulls apart the the, the um, study that they took out, and they only looked at 28% of drug trials, did not look at generic drug trials, which are 80% of the drugs used. And again, in many cases, the, the disaggregated data wasn't available, so how could they analyze it? So she criticized it quite heavily. But it concerns me that in a very, very re you know, reputable journal, uh, an all-male panel addressing this, this issue um, to, to negate it and disagree with it um, occurs and it's still a common feature so um, and I'm not just like oh I look at me a typo there I do apologize um, you know it, it's endemic in in how we approach things we're all conditioned to approach things and it's not just in sort of the human level trial data this this goes right down into into you know, the cellular level um, in many ways and another classic story um, was there's a um, some 2016 research, and this again was um, put forward by Dr. Tamey Martino, and she gave a lecture in 2016 talking about how when you looked at when you were likely to get a cardiac arrest, what time of day um, is it you know, most likely to occur? And they, you know, and what was your survival rate? And they came up with this idea that it happened during the, the daytime, you were more likely to survive. And it came up with sort of quite strong clinical data um, and part of it was down to a greater neutrophil response and with that greater neutro neutrophil response that occurred during the day there was an increased likelihood of, of survival and this was repeated over and over and over again and it was considered a gold standard. 
Then there was a piece of research that came out that actually showed that there was a worse chance of survival if you had a heart attack during the day and you had an increased neutrophil response as, as to that. And, you know, this shocked the original researcher um, because, you know, this has been verified. And when she looked into it, she realised that all the previous mice models that had been used from which this research was, was, was verified from um, and then for applied in the clinical setting, um, we're using male mouse models, which is a very, very common um, issue. Um, and this research that said, actually, there is an opposite effect if this occurs. And actually, if it's in women, because they used all female mouse models, actually survival is worse. And it turned that gold standard on it on its head. And so this is where, um, and that's a story, I think it was in Invisible Woman, but this is a story that, you know, shows you that sex really does matter. And we have to sort of get around for that, um, away from that. And, and it just continues. A classic one, another one that was mentioned is the female Viagra. It was found that there was contraindications with, um, with alcohol. So they decided to do further clinical tests, which they, which they did. They did it on 23 men and two women. And the arguments around why this occurs is normally around the variability of the Easter cycle and, and, and its difficulty with women getting to clinical trials and so on. And it gets worse when you address intersectionality, which I really must stress. You know, you know, we have an issue that mainly of these, a lot of these data sets are built um, around um, male, white European. Um, uh, subjects, but you know you're lacking in female subjects, and then you certainly further disaggregate that, and you're lacking in in certain groups and demographics who who already have to deal with many many um, inequalities within society. So I do recommend these two books. They 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 highlight an awful lot of of stories that show you that this is a really serious issue. It proves that there are sex differences. It proves that there are biases within how we collect data. And it talks about the harms that can occur. And without any sense of exaggeration, significant numbers of women die annually because of this problem. And why is this relevant to AI? Well, AI is because we are using this historical data to build these systems. And we are deploying them within biased um, structural environments. And what we are going to do is we're going to automate inequality. And, and this is where we must avoid this. And again, going, it's a similar slide to what you've seen before, but here I've shown you that you can see that in the whole process of, of designing um, and developing and deploying and decommissioning an AI system, biases can be injected. So yes, there are biases in terms of what goal you have. So often we focus on um, use cases that are very male centric. Um, and we miss out a whole load of, of, of issues that are not female centric. And again, going back to it, you know, when we think about gender or sex based med medica you know, medicine, we think about the bikini. I've not seen that before, the bikini aspect of it, and it's only reproductive. Um, you know, the default male body, even now in medical textbooks, is the male body. And you see that musculature there. So defining your goal is often biased. Your data source is often biased. And even if you have a representative data set that, you know, make sure it's 50-50, men and women, I'm, I'm there, I'm fantastic. The features that you incorporate can also be biased because they can only focus, if you, for example, on cardiovascular or cardiac arrest data, the symptomologies that are only relevant to men. So you can have what you think is a representative data set, but it's still completely biased because the features are not representative at all. And um, you can have um, bias within the data labeling. So if you're looking at image, um, you know, facial recognition and imaging, you know, and you're trying to devise you know, what that label is, the, la the bias um, you know, in the unconscious bias of the labelers and, and, and cultural bias of labelers can have an effect on that and, and really, really in, um, embed again further bias. So that is a very complex and there's human decision making all the way through the development cycle of an AI system. And with human decision making, you will get human unconscious bias involved in that, and sometimes even indeed conscious bias. So you have to really be very, very careful. And admitting, by the way, protective characteristics, which can occur, was once suggested, can actually cause more damage because then you cannot 
actually disaggregate your output data and determine whether there is bias there and then more mitigate against those processes. And you can also have proxies anyway, so you have to be very careful. So proxy can be what type of car you drive, even, you know, what your income level, whether you're part time, full time, whether you own a cat or a dog. I mean, some of these are very sort of stereotypical, but actually they can actually have a work, have, um, have an effect right down to your type of model that you use um, and, and, you know, how you determine the weightings and, and the, you know, how you do the threshold metrics and the way you set your threshold limits on there can be based upon human decision making and value judgments on what is the worst outcome for a false positive or a false negative and that can be again based upon own, own decision making and again referring back to the previous speaker the value of interpretable um, models that you have and an explainable process the whole way through is very, very important so that when you are deploying it and the user is actually using that algorithm, they understand how that decision is made and therefore they can then make an informed decision going forward. Which leads me a little bit to deployment, which I want to very quickly focus on. Um, because when you design your interface for these, so it's not just the model, it's not just the algorithm itself, it's embedded with an algorithmic system, data-driven technologies. How you design that interface, what types of feedback you give to the user, how if you, when you get updates to that model, if it's one that's reinforcement learning or it's batch learning, or you have to update it because it's a static model, but the real world is constantly changing around it and is different how you maintain that algorithm um, and, and keep it deployed in a suitable way is very, very um, um, complicated. And the NIST guidelines for um, risk management in, in AI is, are well worth the read because they're talking about algorithmic change protocols that you need to consider. So it's more complicated. Um, but again, it's this human user interface, making sure we augment human decision making not actually fully automated and, and particularly in high risk situations and then again decommissioning often forgotten about but if you remove a system um, and some people are very dependent upon it and you don't replace it in, in, in an unbiased and you know equitable manner you can create bias there so bias occurs across the whole life cycle and some of you i'm assuming are clinicians within um, the audience and it's not just in the data and the impact on, on patients that can occur and when you have these bias um, systems going forward. So again, uh, you know, if you're doing ECG tracings and you have not represented um, and you're doing diagnostics on ECG um, tracings and you haven't taken into account that women actually have um, a slightly longer QT um, interval than men do and the, the the recent research is getting better, but I was at a biometrics conference in 2019, uh, and it was a private industry-based one. And these were, uh, one presentation was looking at ECG tracings, uh, how that would manage you driving a self-driving car, which was very interesting. I don't know if we were to plug ourselves in and patch all ourselves up while we're driving a car, and it can monitor our ECG tracings. When I went up to them afterwards and said, are you aware? that there are um, sex differences um, in ECGs um, for male and female drivers. And, and they, they were completely unaware of this. So how you can imagine you developing this new technology that's going to be extremely biased in, in usually high, um, high risk and crisis situations, because that's when AI falls down, when you get unusual situations coming forward. Um, th that was very, very concerning. And just going back to that point, when we automate AI solutions within the clinical setting, we risk actually falling foul of the same process. That when there is an unusual occurrence, and an unusual presentation of symptoms, um, the AI system can actually fall down because it defaults to the standards and the norms. And you have to be very wary about that. And this is why the human in the, in, um, in the loop, the human computer interface is really important and the idea of augmented decision making. But the concern is, is that when you're developing these technologies, you can actually embed bias within the, the, the skill set of the clinicians using it. So 
um, it was earlier in the introductions when we talked about the bias within voice recognition and the issues with word embeddings and we're getting an awful lot of examples where you can actually read um, electronic health records or things are being, you know, recording is being um, done, voice recording of instructions and so on and so forth. And there is gender differences there um, between male and female voices. And I do apologise for spitting between the words sex and gender. I'll stick with sex, actually, because I'm talking about that aspect of it as well. You know, it's a main focus. Um, and, and that will have an increased error rate for um, clinicians who are women. And then that can get compounded. And if they have a higher error rate in their, in their career, that can affect their progression. It can certainly have very harmful out outcomes on their patients if information is recorded incorrectly. And then this will just perpetuate um, you know, that, that, that sector bias that occurs between those type of clinicians. So these things can actually occur. Same with augmented reality. Uh, women and men view movement and depth slightly differently. And augmented reality and virtual reality has been designed mainly by a, around the um, male uh, perspective of it and, the, and perception of movement. And it has an increased chance of motion sickness in female users. So if you are defaulting to this type of um, technology within the health sector, again, you're embedding bias within clinicians and keeping an eye on the time, although I am aware you, you you're one speaker down. Um, and this is a common one that I, that I show. Um, and I quite like this. This is a nature article. And it, it, it's one of those articles where you get the better than, you know, AI system can diagnose uh, diseases better than doctors. And, and all of the managers within that, you know, the, the hospitals are rubbing their hands because they've got staffing issues. And, you know, this could be a way of doing it cheaper or maybe using... Um, you know, different grade staff to do the initial diagnos diagnosing and triaging and save on, on more um, expensive um, employees. And let's be honest with you, this is true. Um, and so this is a classic one and um, a very good um, nature survey um, that made this, this claim and it goes out into the media. When you read the article, they are better than the media reporting on it, I have to say. And I looked at it and I thought, this is very good. It's better and it's quite good, good diagnostics there and, and metrics there going forward until we see what the, the model outcomes are. The F1 score is 0.885. And as we can see, yes, it is better. But then as we go to these last three groups of physicians, um, actually, they are better on a singular level. And the difference between physician group three to five and physician group one to three are these are senior consultant level physicians who are highly experienced and these are early career trainee physicians and so that led me to think well that's all very well and good then so how is this going to be deployed and are we going to find in the health sector the same problem that has been found in the aviation industry where you get a concept known as skills fade as it is there and what will happen if this is used as a training tool or these, these trainee physicians and, and, and trainee doctors are using this as their diagnostic default tool and they become trained by this system, which does happen, it's been shown to happen in welfare algorithms, child welfare al algorithms, will they ever develop the skill set of the senior physicians? And this is where we need to really be careful about how we deploy these systems. So having talked to the previous presenter about how you develop them and correct for the bias data and consider the model that you are developing, how you deploy it and use it in the real world is equally important. And here's a classic, another good example of how they did this. And this is the two view system. Now, radiography is a very common early um, uh, use for image recognition for AI um, tools within, within the health sector. And we can talk separately about some issues with that. Very useful for explainable AI. And again, this was this better than doctors, um, better than radiographers um, examples. But what they found was that this idea of this two view system was really important. The algorithm was not as good as two clinicians or one clinician and the algorithm together. 
a physician, one singular physician, was not as good as the algorithm and the physician making the, the decision. So having fully automated processes, I would be very wary of using. But again, how that physician and algorithm interface with each other is very important. And the recommendation is, is that the physician should actually make the decision prior to that, look at the algorithm, and then see if it agrees. And if it disagrees, that triggers a deeper analysis of that process. In the UK, there is a two-view process for, for viewing scans, and this is two clinicians. And think about the learning environment. Think about the dialogue that happens when you have two people disagreeing, and you meet and you discuss, well, what is the disagreement? What are you seeing and what am I seeing? And within that discussion, learning happens and the increase in the skill level of the physician happens and increase in, in the quality of diagnosis and particularly in unusual representations of an illness. That conversation is, is really important. If you fully automate it or you're dependent on a, an AI system and a singular clinician, then that will be lost. So your deployment protocols and your use protocols are extremely important and keeping a very close eye on, on, on the time. And I do apologize. I just want to very quickly talk about a piece of work that I've just been doing, which is the ethical funding for trustworthy AI systems. Because I've been talking about this bias that occurs and the harms that can occur for many years. And I was teaching uh, many, many years ago in high school. And I remember for the high school exam, the A-level exam in the UK, I was giving um, teaching the students about difference in pain medication and um, between the sexes and how this is coming through. If it's out at A level level in 2010, I think that was, then this is something that's generically known and I should not still be seeing it. And I got really fed up of having to go to talks like this and, and teach something that I think is now a given. So I decided to hit people where it hurt, hit them in the pocket, hit, hit them in the funding process. So I started the Ethical Funding for Trustworthy AI project, the Health Foundation, the, 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 the Chartered Institute for IT, the BCS, and Women Leading in, in AI. And what we did is we developed a way, when you are applying or tendering, so you're applying for a grant to fund your project, um, and some of these are millions of pounds, and I sit on a number of funding panels, and I'm getting all of these um, use of AI in healthcare um, applications and looking at it, and none of them address the key points of how to make their AI system trustworthy, fair, and safe for all patients. And it was really concerning. So we developed a set of proposals for introduction of a trustworthy AI statement. So when you are applying for a grant, um, you will be required to outline how you would make your system trustworthy. And in amongst the details of that, would be how you would disaggregate your data to ensure that there is no bias occurring and harms. And this is particularly important for sex differences because we are, you know, women are 51% of the world's population, and yet a lot of these systems have developed for the remaining 49. So this is the big cutoff, but it should be disaggregated and considering intersectional issues. And then the second part of the proposal was looking at the, um, the funding organisations of how they would manage that ethical funding process. And if any of you um, have ever applied for Horizon 2020 grants and new set of grants going forward, I'm sure you're familiar with Horizon. Um, it has been, we did a workshop, we had a, you know, a group of you know, all of the big funding bodies in the UK around, as well as some academics and some clinicians to say how they would address this um, in, 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 in main part it was very very positive the only really strongly negative um, was from the researchers but i think they just don't want to do more work and i completely understand that having done several myself and um, several of my own but they were more concerned with we think it's a good idea but how is it going to practically be achieved because we've seen problems in the past with bioethics um, regulations and guidelines and whether it actually makes a difference was the question that was raised but this has had a bit of an impact, and, and um, I am presenting again to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees um, on, on their control and, and, and data bias, but also we're starting um, a project with the ESPRC, which is the big, big grant funding body part of um, um, in, the, in the UK that funds this type of research, as well as the NIHR, which I, I work with quite a lot, who fund healthcare 
um, research and the AI, and they're adjusting their processes to require people to actually consider this concept of trustworthy AI. So I will end with saying, go back and read what Maria Theresa um, uh, talked about and the articles in the book that she talked about, because it really, really is very, very good. And I think really puts it down in clear detail in a very readable format what you need to do going forward and i shall leave it there and i hope i haven't overrun too much thank you and i will also stop sharing thank you alison that was wonderful call. <laughs> with a lot of implications for grants for what i see <laughs> so we have a uh, time for for uh, questions and discussion at the end if you if you can stay and uh, we move to the uh, to the final speaker, Ethical and Political Implications, by Dr. Teresa Escantamburlo from the European Center for Living Technologies, CAF Oscari University. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Working better and better. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So I will try to share my screen. So can you hear me and can you see my slides? We can see you, but not your slides yet. Wait a minute. Okay. Now we have the slides. Great. Please. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for the invitation and also for the previous speakers. Uh, I enjoyed a lot uh, their talks and I've learned a lot. So just to give you a brief introduction also of uh, what uh, I'm doing and what's my research. Uh, mm, just okay. So uh, I'm working at European Center for Living Technology. I'm a postdoc um, in these research centers, which deals with complex systems and uh, uh, counts projects, ranging from uh, computer vision to um, uh, bioinformatics and the ethical issues also of technologies. And uh, in particular, I'm working on the AI for You project, which is an Horizon 2020 project, um, whose aim is to develop an European, an European platform gathering stakeholders working on AI. And it is a huge project involving uh, uh, 80 partners from 21 countries. And I'm contributing and working closely, by the way, with uh, BSCs um, on uh, two main tasks, the creation of an observatory um, to share knowledge uh, about the ethical, legal, social, economic and cultural issues of AI across Europe and uh, to coordinate also a series of working groups uh, um, on these uh, topics, so ELSEC AI topics. And if you want more, have more information about this work, you can uh, visit the, our website. Uh, so I would like just to give you um, some brief, uh, sketchy, uh, let's say, uh, insight on uh, well, um, what is the European policy uh, to address the ethical implications of AI? And I would like to dig into the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And in particular, I would like to consider one of the requirements, which is uh, focus on bias and uh, non-discrimination. And, um, and then I would like to give you some inputs to um, reflect and to somehow stimulate the debate around the challenges and the opportunities um, around this implementation of EU policies, in particular the implementation of these ethics guidelines. So just to give you, starting with some uh, a clear intuition, I think, uh, when it comes to AI and medicine is that uh, when we applied AI uh, in medicines, uh, we can have huge opportunities. And uh, there are studies, several research witnessing uh, the promises uh, coming from this application. Uh, this is an example, a, a 2018 study uh, reporting a research in collaboration between DeepMind and uh, London's hospital. Uh, basically, they applied an AI system based on deep learning architecture um, to uh, identify, to, to provide some referral suggestions, recommendations uh, using uh, um, 
a computer vision system on uh, three-dimensional scans on the high. And uh, they tested this system and they achieved a very uh, high level of accuracy and prediction accuracy. And uh, basically also comparing the performance of the AI systems with uh, best specialists in the field, they, they somehow observed a similar uh, performance. And so this is for sure a good news. But on the other hand, AI also um, suggests some risk uh, when uh, we apply these systems in medical domains and, of course, even in other critical uh, sectors like, for example, justice or uh, education. But if we consider even in the medical domain, uh, there are uh, some research uh, studies witnessing that uh, we could use AI system and uh, these systems could uh, um, uh, exacerbate uh, uh, racial bias, for example, in identifying uh, the uh, risk, uh, health risk, and, uh, and even other studies, for example, suggested that if we train uh, pre machine learning models um, uh, with some data sets presenting some gender imbalances, we could uh, have poor performance, or at least we have a diversity or, of performance and uh, and disparities. Uh, and so the, the, the system could work uh, worse with certain protected groups. And of course, we don't want to use these systems and create uh, uh, discriminations or uh, um, uh, disparities in the performance. And uh, these are examples of risks uh, taken from the uh, medical domain, but there are many other cases. Uh, and all these cases somehow um, push the community and uh, uh, governments, but even other organizations, non-governmental organizations, in developing principles, uh, somehow guiding uh, the design and the deployment of AI systems. And nowadays, I think uh, the number of uh, uh, principles and guidelines uh, have increased a lot. And there are studies also, or some uh, review studies suggesting that there are hundreds of guidelines uh, nowadays. But most of them somehow shared some common principles like beneficence or uh, do not harm uh, the prevention of harm principles or autonomy and justice. And we have uh, also a, a principle which is uh, specifically um, uh, concerned with the AI system or is a characterizing, uh, let's say, a principle for the AI system, which is explicability. Uh, because we know that the, many of these systems, uh, somehow, especially systems dealing uh, based on uh, deep learning, somehow could uh, um, uh, could could present problems uh, for what concerns the interpretability of the results, uh, and are also known as black, black box models because they don't uh, uh, help uh, the human decision maker or at least uh, the human being dealing with AI systems to inspect and somehow interpret the results uh, in a human, uh, let's say, uh, interpretable way. And uh, the European uh, Union uh, uh, took a clear stance on uh, uh, AI and um, developed an AI strategies based on this human-centered view. Uh, so uh, Europe, the European Commission and the European Union um, uh, developed uh, several measures uh, trying to developing their uh, its own principles and uh, um, in the uh, several communications of the European Commission we somehow extract uh, some intuitions um, on, on this human-centered AI and what it means to develop a human-centered AI um, first of all it means to develop an AI system that people can trust. Uh, so uh, from these uh, uh, very uh, um, basic intuitions, uh, we can derive the idea of trustworthy AI. And uh, it means that um, also people and individual, also the world society can uh, benefit from the use of AI, which means also um, a clear somehow push 
to develop AI systems for social good, for example, so to prioritize applications that could uh, provide greater benefit for the world society. And a third important uh, um, characterizing features of this human-centered uh, view is that AI systems should embed somehow ethical and societal values, um, in particular those uh, which characterize the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And uh, um, on, on more practical uh, point of view, on the more practical side, European Commission um, proposed uh, two um, has made two main steps. Okay, because they have been already made. So first of all, uh, it develops these ethics guidelines. And the second uh, most recent step is the um, proposal for NAI regulation. Uh, so I would like to just uh, observe a little bit more and spend a few words on, uh, about these ethics guidelines. And uh, the guidelines have been actually developed by a group of experts, which was set up by the European Commission. And uh, the group of experts delivered the first uh, um, draft of the uh, of the guidelines in December 2018. Then there was a public consultation, and there was the official delivery in uh, 2018. And I took part also uh, in the piloting process, uh, which somehow tested and collected feedback from several European organizations for the improvement of the guidelines. And the uh, resulted version, new version um, of the guidelines, and in particularly the assessment list, which is at the end uh, of the guidelines and provides a set of questions uh, supporting the um, considerations and the analysis and the assessment of AI system, is delivered uh, has been delivered in uh, uh, 2020. And uh, uh, these uh, the guidelines are, are available online, and there is also a, a web tool. Uh, which is also useful for um, consulting this assessment list. So this is the uh, somehow uh, framework of the guidelines, which is uh, somehow hierarchical, so based on some uh, ethical principles, uh, which can you see are also shared by other um, principles and uh, uh, guidelines offered by other organizations like the one developed by OECD. And uh, the principles are the respect for human autonomy, the prevention of harm, fairness and explicability. And these principles are translated into uh, seven key requirements, which somehow um, achieve a more concrete level and uh, could be somehow embedded or should guide the design process and the world life cycle, the world development um, process of an AI system and can be implemented by both using uh, uh, technical uh, methods and tools, but also non-technical methodologies. And the last layer is um, provided by this assessment uh, of uh, trustworthy AI, which consists of a list of questions uh, divided into the seven requirements. And uh, um, each question should somehow solicit a um, reflections and the conversations upon these requirements and uh, should support uh, the, the team of developers and but also the deployers and the providers of the AI system to somehow consider whether they uh, these requirements have been sufficiently developed or there is a need of uh, more um, further work. So uh, I would like just to give you a, a brief um, and discussion and give, give you some um, uh, insight about one of the requirements, which is diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, because this is probably the requirements which fits um, best the, the topic of this panel dis discussion. And uh, these um, requirements somehow suggest and recommend that we should uh, um, enable in a, an AI system inclusion and diversity. Um, not only, of, of course, at the beginning of the design process, but throughout the entire AI system life cycle. And uh, these requirements uh, look at uh, three main aspects. First of all, um, which is probably the most essential one, is the avoidance of unfair bias. 
So we should uh, try to use all uh, techniques uh, somehow nowadays available. We know that especially in the machine learning community, there has been several studies and uh, uh, progress also on the development of techniques, uh, both in the pre-processing step, but even post-processing uh, step to um, aimed at removing bias and um, unfair, unfairness. Uh, for example, if you think of uh, a fairness metric that can be applied uh, to quantify unfairness in data or in the output of an algorithm and all the optimization techniques that can be applied then to um, remove this bias. But uh, um, an interesting perspective in the, re in, the, in the guidelines in general, but even in this requirement, is that we cannot rest only on technical means. We should also somehow uh, complement the technical tools also with other governance mechanisms. And in particular, we should try to introduce oversight processes, uh, which somehow this can translate into the, the, um, the, the development of teams also which could analyze the system purpose constraints, the requirements and the decision in a transparent way. So there should be, uh, as the, the previous speaker suggested, a human in the loop, uh, which allows human beings somehow to interpret and to also justify the design choices and should somehow constrain the design process. Uh, and this also uh, means that we should move towards different design teams, um, more inclusive, open to people also from different backgrounds and cultures, more interdisciplinary teams. But non-diversity and non-discrimination deals also not only with unfair bias, but also with accessibility and universal design. So this means that we should uh, avoid one size fits all approach. Uh, so when uh, we use, uh, for example, machine learning models for uh, risk predictions or for uh, medical diagnosis, we should also consider whether these uh, applications are accessible and uh, they are designed for all. And this also ha has to do also with the applications of uh, standards from, for example, human computer interactions and uh, other user studies uh, in order to um, uh, make the applications uh, uh, open to the widest um, possible uh, range of users. And uh, these also um, requirements recommend stakeholder participations. Uh, in a way to collect feedback from people who can be directly or indirectly affected. Um, of course, uh, this um, is ra raises a lot of challenges, uh, but before going into challenges, uh, I would like to also to suggest and to show you some um, questions uh, that uh, are proposed in the assessment list for trustworthy AI with respect to these non-discrimination and fairness requirements. For example, they are asking uh, whether the uh, design team um, tested the, 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 the model, for example, for specific target groups or problematic use cases, uh, whether, for example, uh, um, there have been somehow discussions on possible definitions of fairness, uh, for example, a huge debate in the, uh, in the uh, fair machine learning community is uh, there are different definitions of fairness that can be also um, translated into different metrics and uh, uh, we cannot uh, apply and uh, uh, we cannot optimize for all fairness metrics, so we should choose one of these and our choice should, should be motivated and justified. Uh, so there should be a considerations of the world context uh, and uh, uh, somehow a decision, also a, a deliberations on what fairness metrics and definitions makes more sense in, in the context of application. And, uh, and there is also a, um, some other questions dealing with the, uh, the interface of the AI systems. Uh, to understand whether, for example, these uh, applications are available also and, and accessible um, by people with special needs or disabilities. And uh, just to conclude and give you very um, somehow um, 
let's say rough uh, um, in, in rough inputs and uh, and reflections on uh, on points in, in this um, in in the implementation of these requirements. First of all, I think uh, there is a, a, a huge um, opportunity in promoting a different approach and uh, a validation approach towards AI systems. So we are invited uh, in uh, uh, looking at this system not only has a technical uh, and technological uh, tool, but uh, has a socio-technical system, which involves both humans and, uh, uh, and machines. Um, so um, a validation based only on uh, technical metrics and performance metrics uh, are not enough. So we should be able somehow to uh, open and to broaden the develop the the, um, our validation, our assessment process. And uh, another important uh, uh, input, I think, uh, that we receive from these guidelines and in general other um, guidelines on ethical AI is uh, the uh, push towards in interdisciplinary collaboration. So we should somehow uh, become more um, used in uh, collaborating with uh, people from different backgrounds and also be able to bridge conceptual and language gaps because also there is uh, um, uh, a, a problem that we should also deal with, which is uh, the gaps that uh, created by different disciplines. For example, if you just look at the, the notion of bias, we have different interpretations based on um, statistical, uh, for example, disciplines or uh, social sciences, uh, and we should be able to uh, deal with different different conceptions um, and, and trying to to to, to make this uh, uh, to create a meaningful. Teresa, um, we should be finishing because we are running. Uh, okay. Time. Yeah. 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 To leave some time for questions. Yeah, so I, 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 so I, I would finish here, and I, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, as a conclusion that, of course, uh, being demonstrably trustworthy is hard, and uh, for example, a weakness of the assessment list of trustworthy AI guidelines is that uh, most of questions somehow uh, are posed in a way that people can answer are yes or no. So this is a huge limitations, and of course, this cannot be this cannot exhaust the assessment, and we should for we should somehow solicit more practices and uh, experiences uh, that trying to implement these guidelines in concrete real world scenarios. So I finish here and I'm thank you, to thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have a, a few minutes for questions. Uh, there is one from the from the web saying uh, how does any of these discussions on gender and sex relate to pediatric artificial intelligence? So I guess artificial intelligence uh, applied to pediatric um, uh, medicine. I don't know if uh, all the speakers are online, or we can see them. Uh, that's maybe a challenge for the organization. What I will ask um, is why that question was asked, as if, if, if sex differences pre-puberty, let's say, don't exist. Um, I, I, I know, you know that this idea, I presume they're thinking about hormones. I, I don't know. I mean, I would just do as a reminder that there are cellular differences, again, that, that are are very well documented and and that referring constantly to you know differences are due to hormonal post puberty differences might not be might not always be relevant it is relevant i do cons i am very very concerned for example about um trans women and trans men and because there's no data on them whatsoever and i do worry about the harms doing to them if we don't address this properly so um i can't off the top of my head uh, think about um, for a clinical setting for, for children, for paediatrics as such. I do know that the mental health utilised tools, there is a great deal of concern and, and use of AI 
in dealing with, with some of the mental health attributes and the long-term consequences of using an AI chatbot, for example, and how you can get this sort of positive feedback loop down to some very harmful content being recommended is a concern. So I, I, I think my answer to that is there's probably quite a bit of research to do, but I'm also querying as to why it was a question in many ways. If there are other questions? I can elaborate. That was my question, actually. Please, go. And um, I guess the reason why I asked the question was just because I don't really hear these conversations happening so much in the pediatric environment. So in all of the, um, the conversation was focusing on adult patients. And so I was just curious if there's data or talk about this happening in, in a pediatric environment, because it's not something you often hear. Do you hear the bias conversations happening? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. If you are you are hearing the the question? No. I mean, she's um, translate that. She's saying that uh, she often hears this conversation for adults, but she doesn't hear these conversations on sex and gender biases and artificial intelligence for uh, for childs for for uh, pediatric in, in pediatric environments. I guess her pediatric. She's working on a pediatric environment. I guess. Uh, I will come on because I I came back. Well, thank you, thank you for raising it. Um, to my shame, I've never thought of it, um, and I think it needs to be addressed and, and, and further research needs to be done. And I'm certainly, particularly as I'm going into sort of a regulatory um, role going forward, would be something that I would make sure I look into. So thank you very much for that point. It's, it's very well made. If I may add, um, just very quickly to say that uh, we are actually, we are starting, it's true that this is not right now the, the focus, um, but we are really starting to make some noise also in that space, also with the Women's Brain Project. We had a very nice roundtable discussing epilepsy, for instance, in, uh, in children, and uh, there are a number of differences there, and, um, and I found at least the specialists that were attending that, uh, that event were extremely interested in using AI and novel tools and digital biomarkers to make a more precise diagnosis or even uh, identifying the ideal uh, therapeutic cocktail. So I know this is not uh, right now a very hot topic, but it's potentially a new one because there is a lot of interest and there is a lot of need for better tools also in the pediatric population. So I, I can see this coming. I think it's an excellent question. So with us, I you know thanks uh, the speakers uh, and but also all the people that has attended the workshop. Thank you very much.